So we're really excited to be here and give this topic. It's been a goal of mine for the last year, year and a half to, to be here um, because by the time patients come see us, sometimes it's on the further end of the spectrum and the one comment that we always hear is, I wish I had heard this sooner or I wish my doctor had told me this or I wish just there was information that I could have gotten. So this is our way to kind of introduce these different topics and show what physical therapy can do to help you through recovery. Physical therapy really focuses on two things, functional activity level and quality of life. So it doesn't really matter what diagnosis you have. Um, if you have any pain or limitations, physical therapy can benefit you. Um, the first slide here is just the most recent statistics on the new cases of the different types of cancer. Uh, the most common, obviously, are breast cancer and prostate cancer. But with these numbers, it shows how many patients really could benefit from what we have to offer. And we've been reaching out to the doctors, but this is the first time we're reaching out to patients or family members, friends, anybody. Um, the most common diagnoses that we see in our clinic, besides breast cancer and prostate cancer, are thyroid, head and neck, uterine ovarian cancer, um, the brain tumors, melanoma, and osteosarcoma. And for all of you who have gone through treatment, are going through treatment, supporting loved ones who are going through treatment, it involves a lot. So you have surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy, um, bone marrow transplants, immunotherapy. There's lots of trials going on. They're testing new things. So it really does do a lot on your body. Um, so this is a list of the different side effects that most of our patients come in complaining about. And all of these can be addressed. If you're experiencing any of these, you're not alone. So it's really good to see a list of this. And we're going to touch base on everything, but it's going to be brief. If you have questions, just save them for the end. So most commonly, you have fatigue, pain, scar tissue, scars that sometimes are stubborn to heal, that turn into wounds and won't close, um, neuropathy, which then can affect balance and other things. Uh, joint restrictions, so not being able to reach as high, um, muscle tightness, muscle weakness, lymphedema, the urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence, which Terry's a specialist in, and then um, cardiovascular endurance. Okay, and then the different treatments that we do involve stretching a range of motion, strength training, gait and balance training, um, the cardiovascular rehab, lymphedema education and treatment, the pelvic floor um, therapy. And then for every single patient, we educate them on skin care and to reduce re risk of infection. Cellulitis is one of the most common infections that you may experience. So we want to make sure that you reduce that risk. And then Terry's going to start us off. We're going to go through each one of the treatments. We have pictures, videos, and if you have questions, let us know. Yeah. So let's start with stretching. Um, this is something that you should be doing throughout treatment, um, even you know while you're going through chemo and radiation. Um, so we, we broke it down through stretches through different parts of the body. So the neck, chest, shoulders, back, hips, and lower extremities. For all these stretches, it's recommended that you hold the stretch for about 30 to 60 seconds three to five times, and you could do it several times per day. The more you're moving, the less um, side effects you'll see from, you know, a lot of us are just not feeling good, you're sick, you're hurting, you kind of curl up, you've been laying down, you're in the chairs for chemo. So it really puts a, a strain on your body. And so we really need to open you up, get you moving, um, and you'll be feeling a little bit better. Um, so next stretches, some of the muscles we'll um, touch on today are upper trap, levator, scap, and scalenes. So we just have pictures of some. So the one up there is for the um, upper trap, the levator, and the scaling. So um, if you have questions, we're just going to quickly go through them. But these are excellent to get that to keep your um, neck moving, especially if you've had neck, uh, head and neck cancers um, or even breast cancer and you're getting, you're getting stiff. Um, 
For the shoulders, we have a huge list, the corner doorway stretch, TWI's eyes, child pose, triceps, table slides, and um, we don't have a picture of the towel internal rotation stretch. I'll go over that in the dowel external rotation stretch. So up there, you can see you're doing the T and the W. That's the doorway pec stretch, excellent for opening your chest up. Triceps to get the back of the arm. That's really common post mastectomy. A lot of women are like, I'm having a lot of discomfort back here. Um, so you can get on the table and just gently either scooch back to really open up the area or go out to the side to open up the axilla. This is also really good, especially post mastectomy. Um, you could use a dowel to help get your shoulder moving again, either out to the side or turning it out or just straight up and child's pose. Again, you get into this is great for the back and for the arms because you just kind of open everything up. Um, for your back, again, you're probably laying in bed, sitting in chairs, curled up, just in fetal position, not feeling great, most likely. Um, you, you have the single knee to chest, double knee to chest, prone on elbows, and lumbar rotation stretch. So that's double knee to chest, prone on elbows, great to get that extension. Um, lumbar rotation, you just kind of twist side to side. And single knee to chest, if double knee to chest seems to be too aggressive um, and uncomfortable. Um, for your hips, you can target the hamstrings, the piriformis, the hip flexors. Um, so up there, she's doing hamstring. You just use a sheet and pull your leg up. Piriformis, the figure four. Hip flexor, you can do in two ways, either kneeling or if that's too hard on your knees, you could just kind of hang off the end of your bed or a sofa and let your leg dangle and feel a nice stretch right across the hip. Um, and for the lower um, legs, you could do the calf, the soleus, and the quadriceps. So there's two ways to do the quad. You could do it standing, um, so you get a nice stretch in the front of your thigh or lying down in your stomach. That also kind of gets a lot of the hip flexor. Or you could do, so for the calf, you keep your, the back leg straight. For the soleus, you want to get into a little bit of a crouch. Um, so range of motion, um, again, keep moving even if you're not feeling well, just do whatever you can. Um, so cervical rotation, you're going to just kind of turn your head side to side. You can look up and down. Um, wall slides, it's great to just get your arm on a wall and just let it slide up and get that nice stretch going. Um, wall squat, you want to lean on a wall and squat down to work the legs and get a little bit of knee and ankle range of motion and hip as well. Ankle pumps, you're just going to pump the ankle, do circles. These are kind of the just feel good. Um, and heel slides lying down. You want to just slide your heel. Bring the heel towards the bottom. Get your knee moving. Um, and bicycle. Just getting on a recumbent bike and getting your legs pedaling, getting blood flow to, the, to your legs um, and a little bit of cardio. Um, so the other thing um, that we deal a lot with is scar tissue. So we've all seen scars on the outside of our bodies, but this can also happen inside. And scars are basically just an accumulation of um, connective tissue to try to heal the wound, which is great, but the problem is is sometimes they can lead to adhesions, which restricts our range of motion and um, causes pain. So it's not permanent. It can definitely be broken down and organized into a more organized fashion. So if it was kind of discombobulated, you can straighten it out. Um, and there's several different techniques and massages you can do. Um, and it is essential to help regain that normal range of motion. Um, so some of the techniques, we do cross friction massage. So you go perpendicular to the tendon and it's a deep pressure to try to get blood flow to the area and to um, break up some of those adhesions. Skin rolling, you're gonna kind of lift the skin to try to get the multiple layers moving to separate them and get those moving on each other a little better. Um, soft tissue massage, just so you go parallel on the fiber. And lymphatic massage is a really gentle, superficial massage to help the lymphatic fluid, uh, fluids flow um, in a little bit more of an efficient manner. So we have a video from Dr. Jo. She's fun. She's going to teach you how to do scar mobilization. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Dr. Jo. Today, I'm going to talk about scar tissue mobilization. Anytime you have a surgery or maybe a big injury with an open wound, it scars up. The scar tissue is great for healing, but then once it's healed, the scar tissue has nowhere to go. So you have to kind of break it up to get rid of it. So let's get started. Disclaimer alert, disclaimer alert. As you can see here, I have an old scar from a surgery a long time ago. Mine's nice and healed up and it's no longer pink or purple and it's really smooth. 
Yours won't be like this if it's fairly new, but make sure and ask your doctor or physical therapist if it's okay to start doing the scar mobilization because you want it to be completely healed before you start doing any of this. The best way to start is to take a massage cream and just warm up the area and the tissue. So you can just start very lightly with this. You can be very generous with the cream to get everything nice and smooth. You don't have to use cream, but it's a little nicer on your skin. So just kind of getting everything nice and warm in there. You can go front to back across the scar. You can go up and down beside it. After you do that for about a minute, you can start getting a little bit harder with more pressure on the scar. So just kind of now starting off with some circles, but you're putting more pressure, you're pushing on it. Now, if your scar is fairly new, this is gonna be very uncomfortable. You might feel some pops underneath, but that is the scar tissue popping. So if it just hurts for a second, you feel that pop and then it goes away, it's okay. That's the scar tissue breaking up. Then once you get everything nice and warm and moving around, you can start taking two fingers, your thumb and your finger, and actually start twisting that skin a little bit. Try and make sure everything's relaxed up there so you can really move that skin around. So again, you kind of do a twisting motion you can go across the scar, front to back, and then you can go along the scar, up and down. You can do both on each side. You can kind of alternate it. So it's really just trying to move that top layer of skin around from the bottom layer so you're breaking up that scar tissue. And you can do this about three to five minutes, once or twice a day. So, um, so when can you begin scar tissue mobilization? Usually about a week after surgery, you can start two to three inches away from the incision site. And then once the actual wound, the incision is fully healed and closed, you can get onto it and work on it. Um, and again, your physical therapist or doctor will, should guide you on that. Um, and then there are other things that can kind of help speed up the process as well. Silicone sheets, different creams, um, taping techniques, and compression garments help break up some of those adhesions and, and um, the scars so you have um, more range. Okay. Just, oh, quick, I don't know okay. Do what? So, click on that one. So when it gets to the video, just click. Okay. Okay. So once you kind of start with the more superficial layers, the scars, getting a little bit more of the range of motion, then we're going to go deeper. So after mastectomies, right, your arms, you've kind of had them down. It, it's really painful to reach overhead or the joints after a month or two of not really being able to move as much, the joint gets really stiff. So joint mobilizations is one of the techniques that we use where we actually go in and get the bone to glide at the joint. So there's different levels or intensities. So if we do a lighter mobilization, then it helps more with the pain. And initially you might have to start uh, more gentle because you might be in more pain. And then as it loosens up, then we can go further. And that way you can get more of the stretch. And then the stronger the mobilization, the looser you'll get. So we have a video that's gonna show the different mobilization techniques at the shoulder, but every single joint in the body has a mobilization technique. So we can do an ankle, we can do a knee, we can do um, the elbow, the wrist. So um, whether you have cancer that is involving like the bone, which then at the knee, then you get knee stiffness, um, this is a technique that can benefit you. Another extremely important mobilization technique for the glenohumeral joint and all joints of the upper extremity is traction. Traction can be added in a number of ways. I can grasp both sides of his arm with my hands and lean back with my body weight. I can have the client hold on as we see here to the other side of the table so there's a little less body motion. I need to make sure I get to the end of his body moving and then add a little more so we're getting traction at the actual glenohumeral joint. Another way is I can hook around his forearm and pull back. But really the most efficient way to perform traction for the glenohumeral joint is to do it standing.
The most efficient way is to place his upper extremity between my thighs. I clasp in with my thighs and I can lean back with body weight. This performs traction very nicely and easily biomechanically. And traction is an excellent addition to any other mobilization that we're doing here. So for example, I could perform traction and then do a posterior glide. Or perform traction and do an anterior glide. Or perform traction and do a superior glide. Or perform traction and do an inferior glide. Who knew a shoulder could move that much? But that guy was pretty flexible. <laughs> but this is something that will start in physical therapy, but this is also a technique that I've been able to teach husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, kids. So a lot of times this will help at home. So if I can teach someone else to do it, then if they do that before you go into some of the stretching, it will not be as painful or you might even feel a little bit looser. Okay, anybody here have neuropathy? This is kind of the nagging side effect that most of our patients complain about. And so usually it's a side effect of the chemotherapy so that damages the nerves. Sometimes it's reversible. Sometimes it'll get a little bit better but not go away completely. Um, but there also are other causes of neuropathy. So there's diabetic neuropathy. Alcoholism can cause neuropathy. Low vitamin B levels can cause neuropathy. So if you have other conditions that, that also cause it, then it's like a double whammy. And then um, at least some of them you can get supplements or um, take steps to help reduce it a little bit. But same thing with chemotherapy-induced um, neuropathy. So a lot of the symptoms are the pain, numbness, tingling, burning. Um, Difficulty using things with your hands, so whether it's buttoning up shirts, grabbing um, small items, or feeling clumsy with your hands, dropping things. Um, balance is a big issue, so whether you're tripping, or you feel less stable. Um, depending on what nerves are involved, you could have different symptoms. So sometimes with the head and neck, if they do radiation, you can end up with um, difficulty swallowing, if you have uterine ovarian cancer, bladder cancer, you can end up with um, trouble passing urine, it can affect blood pressure, and then one of the telltale signs is decreased reflexes. Um, so the treatment is a big group effort, so it crosses multiple disciplines. You'll probably be referred to a neurologist, your senior oncologist might be see pain management, you might then be referred to the East-West Center, and you can be referred to PT and OT. So each discipline uh, takes a different approach to all help manage your symptoms. So you're going to probably be on some medications like gabapentin or neurotin. Um, you might be getting acupuncture or acupressure. The um, occupational therapist will probably be working on the hands to help find different ways maybe to help you with gripping activities or desensitize. If you're more sensitive to heat or cold, they can work on desensitization exercises. And then in physical therapy, we can use some of the electrical stimulation, but we also really focus on the gait and balance. Anybody know why gait and balance is really important? Exactly. <laughs> so one of the other side effects of the treatments that you're going through is low bone density, so osteoporosis. But also, it's a side effect of aging. So you can get at, at that from both sides. So if you're at a higher risk for falling and a higher risk for fracture, then um, we want to try and prevent falling. So that's our whole goal, is to improve strength, stability, um, body awareness, as well as endurance, and exercise, specifically um, like weight-bearing exercise, walking programs, and gentle resistive exercises is proven to help build bone density um, to help reduce um, risk of fractures. 
and improve uh, bone health. So we have two videos. The first video is a report on a study that gives some exercises. It's actually on diabetic neuropathy, but the exercises are um, the same. And then the second link is Dr. Joe again, going through a balance exercise progression. So treatment, relevant research treatment for peripheral neuropathy is one done by Richardson, Archives of Physical Medicine, uh, two, uh, 2001, and the article is called A Focused Exercise Regimen Improves Clinical Measures of Balance in Patients with Peripheral Neuropathy. It was a three-week program. They did daily exercises, and they improved, people who did it improved on balance, and these patients had a documented diabetic neuropathy. The program was a warm-up of doing alphabet circles, and we've done that with our patients. You have them uh, with their foot, just draw the alphabet. So A, B, C. I even had a gentleman from Israel who did it in the Hebrew letters, which is sort of interesting. Uh, but, you know, that was his alphabet. Um, so you warm up with that, and then you do toe-heel raises. You do it bilaterally, and then you do it unipedal. You do it on one leg. And again, at the very end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this. Okay, I'm showing you now with my hands, but I'm going to show you with, with my feet in just a minute. Uh, then you do inversion, eversion on both legs, and then you just do it on one leg. And the final thing that Richardson did is wall slides. The person slides down the wall to 45 degrees um, and tries to hold it for a few seconds and then comes back up. Um, for all of these exercises, the toe raises, the inversion, eversion, and the wall slides, start slow. A person may be able to do, you know, five with both legs, and then you want them to build up to 30. Once they can do three sets of 10 or 30, then you have them do it on one leg. So, and for example, the toe heel raises. You'd have them start with five on both legs, build up to 30. Once they build up to 30, then you have them do toe heel raises, five on one leg, until they can eventually do 30. Uh, and at that point, you're going to see some real good results. So let me show you those real quickly, uh, and then we'll use that research. So the exercises uh, in Richardson's study were the ankle alphabet, so A, B, C, all the way down to Z. And then you have your toe-ups, all right, bilateral, and then unilateral, all right, toe-ups, heel-ups. Then you have your eversion, inversion bilaterally, then you have your ever, inversion, eversion unilaterally, and then the last is your 45 degree uh, wall slide and back up, and then you do it on one leg, 45 degree and back up. So those are the Richardson activities. There's the research. Use it. Everybody, I'm Dr. Joe. Today we're going to work on some balance exercises and the key to balance is strong ankles. So the exercises we're going to be doing today are focusing on our ankles. So let's get started. So usually what I tell my patients when we're working on balance exercises is start with progression. So if you have weak ankles, uh, if you've had a surgery or an injury, you don't want to end up hurting it even more or falling while you're working on these balance exercises. So I always tell people to start off holding on something with two hands. You want to hold on with two hands, you want to make sure that you're good, you're balanced, and you're using proper technique. Once you get that down, then you can hold on with one hand, and then you can drop down to a finger, and then eventually not hold on to anything at all. So I'm going to show you not holding on to anything at all because I don't have any injuries to my ankles. They might be a little weak, but I don't really need to hold on anymore. So the first one we're going to do is basically just putting your feet as close together as you can. Now this seems really easy, but if you've got something going on with your ankles, if they're weak, this is going to be a little hard. We call this the Romberg stance. You're just going to stand there. If this is actually easy for you, then you can close your eyes. That's the next step. You want to be able to stand here for 20 to 30 seconds. If that's easy, then when you're standing here, you can start turning your head from side to side, getting some movement in there, making your eyes change focus while trying to keep the balance. You can go side to side, you can go up and down. 
If that's easy, then you can do that with your eyes closed. So you're going to close your eyes, go side to side. You can probably see I might be moving a little bit more. You might be feeling like you're moving a lot, so that's when you can hold on. And then up and down. All right, the next progression to that is putting one foot in front of the other. We call this a tandem stance. Uh, so you're just going to stand here, try and balance. If this is easy, then you can go through the same progression as the other ones. You can move your head side to side. You can move it up and down. You can close your eyes. And then you can close your eyes and move it. And as you can see, it's not easy for me. So you want to start off holding on holding on with one hand and work your way up. Now remember if you put your left foot in the front, switch halfway through so you get so you work both sides. And the same thing, eyes closed, head moving, a little bit of loss of balance, but I'm catching myself. So that's the key. And remember, hold on, start off holding on and work your way to not holding on at all. After you get all that down, then you can try standing on one foot and go through the same process again. If standing on one foot seems easy, then you can close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open, do head movements, or you can do a combination of both. Remember, hold on to start off with. We don't want you to injure your ankle even more because if you're wiggling around and you're not able to hold yourself, you might end up rolling your ankle. So re remember, start off holding on, progress your way up as your ankle gets stronger. Now, if all that is easy, you've worked your way up and you want to try something a little bit harder, you can get an unlevel surface. I usually just say start off with something like a pillow. And I like to cover up my pillows if I got shoes on so I don't get anything on my pillows. And you can start the whole process over again. So first, you would just be standing with your feet together in that Romberg stance. And you can do your head movements, you can do your eyes open, eyes closed, and you can do your eyes closed with the head movements. You can also turn it a little bit of an angle and do your tandem stance with all those same processes. Again, building your way up, holding on if you need to. And then the last one, standing on one foot. And then going through all those again. So if you can stand on a pillow on one foot with your eyes closed and turning your head from side to side and not fall over, you're doing pretty good. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> but all these videos purposely are on YouTube so that you, have, you can access any of these from your own home to kind of review um, them as well. So. I'm just going to talk about cardiovascular rehab really quick because it's separate from traditional physical therapy. So there's traditionally two branches. There's cardiac rehab and pulmonary rehab. These are clinics that are uh, specially set up with teams that involve nurses, doctors, physical therapists, nutritionists, psychologists. And so they have programs that um, will help with exercise, um, counseling, and help you through recovery. Um, pulmonary rehab is beneficial if you've had like lobectomies or you've damaged your lungs after radiation and you're having a lot of breathlessness and difficulty breathing. They will help with energy conservation strategies, breathing, and um, basically get you back to, maybe if you're doing housework and you get really tired or walking and you get um, out of breath, they'll help with that. The American Heart Association for exercise, uh, cardiovascular exercise, walking, biking, running, swimming, um, recommend about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So if you break that up, that's about 30 minutes, five days a week. Or you can do vigorous activity, 75 minutes, which is about three um, days a week for 25 minutes. Or you can do a mixture of the both. Um, for strength training, also, they suggest at least two days per week of muscle strengthening. And then specifically for anyone who has high cholesterol or high blood pressure, which majority of the patients that we see do have this, um, they suggest 40 minutes of a mixture of moderate or vigorous activity uh, three to four days a week. For strength training, we always want to start light and work our way up. So we call it progressive resisted strengthening. And 
the goal is to decrease the muscle atrophy that you have, um, regain endurance, strength, and functional use of legs, arms, for whether it be sitting to standing, walking up and down stairs, um, lifting, carrying, pushing, pulling, um, getting back into yoga or um, any other exercise programs that you might be doing. Um, the types of exercises that we use usually involve therabands, free weights, machines, or even just body weight exercises like planks, push-ups, sit to stand, squatting, lunging. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends two to three um, days a week uh, for each major muscle group. And then for number of repetitions and uh, sets, they recommend two to four sets. And the number of rep repetitions depends on your goal. So most people, um, we usually say like three sets of 10 to start out with. So eight to uh, 12 repetitions is more for strengthening, just getting the muscle active again. And then if you want to work more on endurance, like if you're carrying groceries and have to walk up um, from the parking lot to your car or your car all the way up to your apartment or house, um, then you want to do more like 15 to 20 reps. But most times we usually go like up to 15 because then you'll cover both areas. These are just some pictures of like an overhead uh, tricep exercises, rowing, cable column, and elliptical. But there's lots of exercises out there. It all depends on what your needs are. And then Terry's going to take it over. You got your mic. So one of the other things that we um, deal with, or that's a side effect of cancer treatments, is lymphedema. And it's an abnormal accumulation of protein-rich fluid. And it's usually caused by abnormal development or injury to the lymphatic system. So mastectomies, abdominal surgeries can all destroy the lymphatic system. Um, radiation as well can cause fibrosis and damage to the lymphatic system. Um, and basically what happens is your the fluid isn't able to flow properly in the vessel, so it's getting pushed out into your fluid and you, uh, into your body and you get swelling. So your arms might swell up, your, limb, your legs, your abdomen, um, head and neck. Um, it is the number one cause. In, um, cancer is the number one cause in the US um, of secondary um, lymphedema. So there are four stages, stages zero, one, two, and three. Um, stage zero, there's no visible swelling, but you may have like subjective, my arm feels heavy, it feels full, it's just achy, um, but you can't really see it. Um, but you are kind of at the beginning stages of lymphedema. There's decreased um, uh, flow. Stage one, um, you can actually see observable swelling. You may even have pitting. So if you push into you know, the leg or the arm, you'll see the dent. It stays in there for a while, and then it takes, you know, we grade it based on how long it takes for it to fill up again and come back to normal. Um, but it, can, it waxes and wanes, it fluctuates. So it's better in the morning for some reason, or it's better at the end of the day. Um, and that's stage one. Stage two, um, the pitting is becoming worse, the fluid is getting thicker, and now you're also seeing skin changes. So the skin is getting um, less, less mobile, so it's thickening. Um, and by the time you get to stage three, um, you see that over there, which is what we're trying to prevent. So you're having skin changes like keratosis um, and papillomas, um, a lot of fibrosis going on. And this is, again, why we're so passionate. We want to try to get to you before it gets that bad, because the sooner you get to us, the easier the treatment is. Um, and yeah. And it, this also, uh, Francis is going to get into it, but because the fluid isn't flowing as well, you are at increased risk of infection of cellulitis. Um, so some of the characteristics, it's slow onset and progressively gets worse. It usually starts distally, so in the fingers or toes and works its way up. It's usually asymmetric unless you've had something done bilaterally. Um, and again, cellulitis is really common um, because you're, you're not flowing as well. So the fluid is just kind of staying there and the bacteria is growing. It is rarely painful unless you have cellulitis. The cellulitis is what would be painful, but you would have complaints or symptoms of discomfort, um, heaviness, achiness, um, and you would see skin changes, um, but ulcerations are unusual. So, the sooner you get in to see us or you go talk to your doctor, the easier the treatment is. So you can get lymphedema during treatment, right after treatment, 20 years 
yeah. away from getting treatment. Um, so anyone who has surgery, radiation, um, are technically in that stage zero. So um, anyone who is at risk should have a compression garment. And we've been working with the doctors to get them to put in the request either to come see us if the insurance doesn't need an authorization to make sure that you get, you get fitted for a garment. But treatment usually involves compression, exercise, massage, sometimes a pump. You don't always need a pump. Um, and you shouldn't only be treated by a pump. And then skin and nail care, education, especially on precautions and infections, and um, sometimes bandaging to reduce your swelling. So in treatment, usually what we'll do is we'll see if you have swelling. If you're in stage one, then we usually just can do a garment. But if you're in stage two or three, we have to reduce the limb first. Or if you have the like, head and neck cancer, there's a garment and massage techniques for that. But we'll put bandaging or use a reduction kit that looks very similar to the Velcro. Um, because if you're fitted for a garment, it keeps you at that size. It will not reduce you. So if you have swelling, you need to be in bandaging or get it reduced first. And then the garments, there's different types. So if you have like rheumatoid arthritis or really hard time gripping or pulling up socks, you do not want to be in one of the standard garments because they're really tight and hard to put on. So there's different options, whether it be Velcro, zipper, um, but we want to make it as easy for you to manage and get it on. We had one patient, it took like 45 minutes to put on a garment, and that is not um, going to make sure that she does that every day. And you want to make sure that you're being measured by someone who is trained to do it because you want to make sure it's the correct size. Some have to be made custom. If you have like a more significant swelling, you might need a different type of fabric. So we work a lot um, with different companies to try and get you the most comfortable garment that will maintain you. Um, this is a picture of a cellulitis infection. So your lymph system is part of your immune system because it helps carry the debris away and your lymph nodes filter it out. So if you have that fluid sitting there and you get a cut or a scratch that some bacteria can come in and you get an infection, so the signs are like that red map-like rash. Your swelling can actually increase. It'll be painful or tender to touch, painful to walk or move. And then most people will have a fever or flu-like symptoms. And if you have any of these symptoms, you want to go to the doctor immediately, whether it be urgent care or calling up your doctor, because you need to go on antibiotics immediately. And if you're in treatment or you are using a pump or doing massage, you have to stop, because all those um, techniques, whether it be massage, pump, exercise, increases your blood flow, and then you can spread the infection through the blood flow. So it's really important to get on antibiotics and have that clear up as soon as possible. The National Lymphedema Network has a list of risk reduction practices. When we see people, we give them that list on the first day. And so the most important thing is um, if you have um, mastectomy, lumpectomy, or anything involving the breast or arm, not getting um, injections or blood pressure taken on that side, doctors and nurses are really good about telling patients this, but not always. I've had patients actually say they've had their blood pressure taken on that side, so sometimes you have to be really diligent too when you go to the doctor to say, not that arm. And then um, heat and cold. So heat, anything over 102 degrees, so people who love sitting in hot tubs, I'm sorry if you have leg swelling. But um, heat increases the um, blood flow to that area, it dilates your blood vessels. And so if you have swelling in your feet, ankles, legs, you don't want to be sitting in a hot tub um, for very long. If it's your arm, then you can rest your arm on the outside of the, the hot tub. But also on the other side, cold. So if you like going to Big Bear or Mammoth, you want to make sure that your, your skin is covered and you're warm because um, if your skin starts drying or cracking, that's a way in for um, bacteria and infection. Um, same thing with sunburns. So wearing 
lots of sunscreen or covering up. Um, people who have pets like to garden, do dishes, anything that can make you susceptible to scratches, punctures, wearing gloves if you're washing dishes or doing gardening, um, wearing pants if you have pets that like to jump on you, um, anything that will constrict or cut off circulation or cause a tourniquet, so whether it be watches, um, tight bracelets, um, shirts that have tight um, sleeves, pants like sweats that have the elastic on the bottom, tight socks that have the elastic up the top, or even tight shoes that will cut off the circulation to the foot. And um, people who like sitting with their legs crossed, that will cut off the circulation, so you have to keep your feet flat. Um, and then weight, if you have um, abdominal or leg swelling, um, weight is one of the most important things because adipose tissue also crushes the lymphatic system. Your lymph vessels sit in, underneath your skin, the most superficial ones in your fat layer. So um, if the heavier you are, the more um, risk you have for uh, decreased flow. And then with the garments, it's suggested that anytime you fly, you wear your compression garments because the cabin pressure actually decreases. So the pressure on the limb is less, so you're at more risk of swelling. But it's also important, you'll hear always about DVTs for flying. So compression also helps with um, reducing your risk for DVTs. And then Terry's gonna talk about pelvic floor. All right. All right. Wait, am I on? Oh yeah, okay. Last topic, and the one that always makes people blush, the pelvic floor. Um, so a lot of people deal with this, whether or not you've been treated for an abdominal um, cancer, um, any type of treatment can affect it. Um, so we really treat um, any of these, urinary incontinence, pelvic pain, fecal incontinence. I mean, not alone if you're experiencing it, don't be shy, ask your doctor, talk to them about it. There is help out there. Um, so what is incontinence? Fecal incontinence is the unintentional loss of stool or gas. We can also help with constipation. Um, urinary incontinence is, there are several types, stress, overflow, urge, and continuous. So stress is when you get leaking with sneezing, coughing, jumping, laughing, things like that. Um, overflow incontinence, it takes a long time to urinate or there's a dribbling after you're done. Um, urge incontinence is that get out of my way, I gotta get to the bathroom right now. Um, uncontrollable urge to get you know, to urinate. And continuous incontinence is you just can't control it at all. There's absolutely no control. Um, so some of the causes, um, a lot of the, again, cancers near the pelvic region, prostate, colorectal, urethra, bladder, gynecological, uterine, ovarian, things like that. Anything that requires radiation or surgery to the abdominal area um, it can, can lead to it. Um, brain and spinal cord cancers can also do it because it can affect the nerves that control um, the bladder, um, lung and esophageal cancers, because you're coughing so much, if you're not properly contracting, you can also eventually, if you're, if you're not tightening, it can lead to um, extra stress on the bladder and that can lead to incontinence over time. Um, breast cancer, you're dealing with a lot of hormones and people often choose to get prophylactic um, hysterectomies or you know different things. So um, those hormone changes can also thin the tissues in the pelvic floor and make it harder to, to, to effectively contract and prevent leakage. Um, so again, radiation can do it. It changes the consistency of the tissue, causes fibrosis, so you're not contracting as well. Um, and I think we covered everything else, the surgery um, and all of it. So what can you do for it? In physical therapy, we'll teach you how to properly do um, pelvic floor um, activation if that's a problem, or if you have pain, we downtrain. So we go in the opposite direction and try to ease the muscles. Um, electrical stimulation, again, to help you get that proper contraction. Um, we do a lot of manual techniques to loosen them up if that's what's necessary. And um, bladder training, um, teaching, you know, we make a good um, voiding schedule um, and fluid and dietary management. We also do a lot of biofeedback. So just like you get an EKG on the heart, we can do it on the pelvic floor so you can see your muscles and how they're activating if they're doing it properly. Like, you know, if patients are like, I can't tell if I'm doing it, now you can do it, you can tell. Um, medications help medical devices like a pessary or a plug. Um, they do injections like collagen or Botox to the bladder. Um, and hormone estrogen it helps um, regenerate some of that tissue in the pelvic floor. And um, surgeries like the mesh wrestling. Um, for fecal incontinence, we talk about um, 
dietary changes and using um, laxatives. Um, the biggest thing um, is, to, is really the hygiene, is protecting skin breakdown. So you want to use creams, pads, um, proper hygiene, because that's a big thing with fecal incontinence is skin breakdown. Um, it's very acidic. So. Um, and yeah, again, biofeedback therapy helps as well. Um, it can teach you, it can show you that you're doing the contractions properly and when you start to lose the strength, so you can, you can work on it. Um, so we have a couple of videos and don't be shy, go ahead and practice. It's not so scary. We'll the first one's just the Oh, the first one is to show you what we do, um, how, one of the treatments that we're gonna do. Go for it, okay. What we're gonna do is just give you a, a quick demonstration of how to access the pelvic floor muscles externally, always externally, um, and, and uh, these are the muscles that we're gonna be working on. And if I, can, if I pull out the urogenital diaphragm, which I can do right here, let me do this real quick, um, it, just re it just shows us the muscles of the pelvic floor, and we're gonna be accessing these muscles all done externally, will never go in the vagina that way. So the first thing you want to uh, target is the sits bone. And there's a sit bone right here, that's the bone that we sit on, and we're going to target that, and we're going to slide our finger in and start to feel around to see if we got any triggers. And then what we do is we take our finger up, 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 like we're going to the tailbone, and then we can bring it down the other side, poking and poking and poking and poking, and see if we find any triggers. Then we go down from here and come down to the pubic bone and then come back up to the other side. And there's no particular order to this, it's just wherever you find a trigger point. When you find a trigger point, you push on it and the patient will say, oh, don't go any further, that hurts. And you hold that nice steady pressure and when the person says, all right, it's not so bad anymore, you can actually have the person then attempt to push your finger out like that. And what they're doing is they're using these muscles. So the muscles we're gonna be going after are puborectalis, that goes from the pubic bone all the way around the rectum. Um, pubococcygeneus, the pubic bone, all the way up to the coccyx, iliococcygeneus, ischiococcygeus, and all of these muscles are accessible through poking uh, right in this area and you don't have to go inside. So what it's gonna really look like is this. You find the ischial tuberosity just like that. You go medial, which means you come into the center, just tip off of the bone and you, f and you just poke in there. And you go as, as good force as you can and if that's not a problem, then you slide up a little bit. Now here's our coccyx, so here's we're heading up this way and we keep pushing in and pushing in and pushing in until we get to the coccyx. And then we come down here and we do the same thing. We keep pushing in, pushing in, pushing in, and all the time you're really not going inside the body cavity at all. And now here's the ischial tuberosity right here. So I went from this ischial tuberosity over here, just came all up and around and came down to this one. And then what you do is you start going down, 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 and now I'm on the pubic bone, okay? And then I would come all the way back up, and each time I go in, I push, and I push, and I push, and to see if I can find any trigger points. So let's say I found a trigger point right here, and I push in, and the patient says, oh, don't push any further, and I just hold it, and hold it, and hold it, and all of a sudden the patient says, it doesn't feel like you're pushing so hard, or I hardly feel that anymore, and I'll push a little harder, and they say, okay, don't go any further, and I'll stay right there, and I'll stay right there, Stay right there, hold it steady, and they say, boy, I don't feel that very much at all. And when I can push in there and they say, really, I don't feel that hardly at all anymore, I'll have them try to push my thumb out. So try to push my thumb out, and as she does, you can really feel her using her muscles to drive my thumb out. I'll have her hold it for 10 seconds, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now go ahead and release, take a nice deep breath and I'll go in and I'll see if I can find anything. And most of the time now you're going way up in there and she says, nope, I don't feel a darn thing. I said, let's do it again, push my thumb out. And she pushes and here she's just pushing it right out. And I, and I say, hold it for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, release, take a nice deep breath. And I'll do that once or twice. And it should be without a trigger point after that. And you're also training them how to use the muscles to, to contract those muscles in the pelvic floor. 
Hi, today I'm going to show you how to do your pelvic floor exercises and get started with your pelvic floor exercise program. If your pelvic floor muscles are really weak or if they're not working well, it can be really hard to know if you're doing your pelvic floor exercises correctly using the correct technique. So these little tips and techniques I'm about to show you will help you get started on your way to getting your pelvic floor strong. Okay, so let's take a look at the pelvis. Here's the female pelvis. It sits like there, bony structure. So you've got a pubic bone here at the front of the pelvis and a tailbone at the back. Now your pelvic floor muscles actually sling like a hammock underneath there from front to back. They also sling from side to side between the sit bones. So sometimes it's described as a trampoline, the pelvic floor muscles are described as a trampoline under the pelvis, but that's where they sit. So by strengthening those muscles, you're trying to get these muscles thicker and sitting more supportively and stronger inside your pelvis to help your pelvic floor whether and pelvic floor problems, whether it's a prolapse or whether it's continence issues, or you might be trying to relax your pelvic floor muscles if you've got pelvic pain. So that's where those muscles sit. So that they're not uh, outside, they're not your buttocks, so not where you're sitting. They're actually muscles and they're not the inside of your thighs, they're actually inside. And they actually encircle the three pelvic openings. So for women, this is the urethra or the opening to your urine tube, your vagina, and then the anus. So those three openings, so they're wrapping around and encircling those. So when you're doing your exercises, it's useful to visualize that area underneath your pelvis. So if you're sitting now, you can feel the area between your sit bones and from front to back, your pelvic floor muscles are in and around that area. Now that's the area we're going to be exercising. So I've got some nice little uh, tricks to help you get started. And the first one is using a towel roll. So I've got a little towel roll here. This is just uh, a towel folded in half and folded in half again. You could use a hand towel at home if you wanted to. And basically you roll it up so it's about a hand circumference around. I'm going to use that like a little saddle. So I'm sitting on a stool here, you could be sitting on a chair at home. And coming up and just sitting, so that I'm actually sitting on that rolled towel so that I can actually better feel my pelvic openings when I'm sitting on that. If you don't want to sit on a, on a rolled towel, you could sit on a firm armchair of a lounge chair perhaps to feel what's going on or maybe even a, a big exercise ball, that could also help. Now in that position, we're going to start to try and identify the little bits of the pelvic floor muscles that are actually encircling or the parts of the pelvic floor muscles that are encircling your openings. Let's start with in and around the anus, those muscles in and around the back passage or anus. Now, you can try to draw up, and, the, and remembering that your pelvic floor contraction feels like a squeeze and inwards lift in and around all your pelvic openings together. So try to squeeze in and around the anal area and lift inside. Can you feel that at home? You try to squeeze and draw inwards and lift and lower back down. Now the muscles around the anus there, those ex the muscles of the external anal sphincter, are part of the pelvic floor. Now move forward to around the vagina, and this could be hard to feel, and try to squeeze and lift inwards in and around the vagina. So try to draw up and try to lower down. You might not be able to lower down, you might feel that it's already gone, and that's okay. The idea at first is to try to see if you can get a feeling of a contraction. Then move forward to in and around the urine tube or the urethra or the opening of the urine tube and try to sense a movement and a squeeze and small inwards lift in and around that urethra. Lower back down and relax and take a breath. Big breath in and out. And now let's try and do all three together. So the back, middle and front, all those openings together, squeezing and lifting inwards. Now try to keep lifting at home, keep lifting if you can, and now lower down slowly and let it all relax. How did you go? Could you feel a movement or could you not feel much at all? Sometimes if the muscles are really weak it can be really hard to feel anything happening at all and initially we'll start on the towel roll or start using another technique and then you might find that you can get enough strength and the capacity to actually not have to worry about using the towel roll. I'm going to move the towel roll now and again we'll do this on a chair so if you've got a towel roll at home maybe you can move that to the side and put it down and I want to just talk you through correct technique. 
So, correct techniques and tips to get the most out of your pelvic floor exercises. First of all, sitting tall. So posture needs to be tall. You need to have an inward curve in your lower back. If you're slumped, you won't get nearly as an effective pelvic floor contraction. So inward curve in the lower back is really important. So nice tall posture, tall through your spine, shoulders are back and down. Let's go again, try to lift and squeeze through your openings. The back, middle and front together, lifting up, squeezing, squeezing and lifting, keep lifting and try to keep breathing. Breathe throughout, now lower down slowly, slowly, slowly and relax. Take a deep breath in and out. Things to avoid, not squeezing your buttocks. This is not about your buttocks. This is not about inside your thighs. And this is not about drawing your tummy in strongly either. The other thing to try and avoid is um, holding your breath. So those four things, buttocks, thighs, um, tummy muscles being drawn in too strongly and holding your breath. Try to keep your normal, regular breathing throughout. So that's, that's just a little starter on how to get going with your pelvic floor exercises and how to start feeling your pelvic floor muscles at home. Let's review what we've just talked about. We talked about how to locate your pelvic floor and pelvic floor muscles and we talked about them sitting inside that area in and around where you sit. Then we talked about um, ways of actually feeling those pelvic floor muscles and we talked about using a towel roll to sit on the towel roll to feel your pelvic openings and to feel the action of the pelvic floor muscles. And then finally we talked about getting the right technique and getting the most out of your technique. Sitting tall with the inward curve in the lower back and making sure that you're not using the other muscles around the pelvis and mistaking those for the pelvic floor muscles. So if you'd like some more information now to continue with your pelvic floor exercises, check our pelvic floor exercises library and you'll get your information on how now to progress your exercises and make your pelvic floor muscles stronger. Well that's it for me, for me today. I look forward to exercising with you again soon. Bye for now. I just, I'm, this is another thing I'm passionate about because it is really debilitating. A lot of my patients say, I can't go to a farmer's market because there are no bathrooms accessible. I just go to places where I know there's a bathroom. So if you are one of those people, please talk to your doctor. There is help out there. So, yeah. So we basically wanted to give you all this information to show that there is help out there depending on maybe what your needs are. You might have issues with just strength or range of motion. You might be having some of the incontinence. You might be experiencing some of the swelling or neuropathy. But any symptoms that you have, we treat everybody individually. So when you have the eval, we'll look at everything. You might have other conditions or comorbidities that need to be addressed too or we need to take caution with. So everything is based on what your goals are, what activities you want to get back to, what's affecting your daily activities or your um, recreational activities or um, hobbies. So um, everything that you want to get back to, we can help you with. Um, you have any other comments? No. No. So um, we do have a list of references. So we used a lot of information from the American Cancer Society, the National Lymphedema Network, American Heart Association, Nas the National Institute of Health, American College of Sports Medicine, cancer.net, and aboutincontinence.org. So there's a lot of places that you can go to get all the information that was also in this uh, presentation. But any other questions that you guys have? Yeah. Um, very useful information, thank you. Uh, I have, I'm three and a half years old after a bone marrow transplant. It's going well, I've got graft versus host in the medium range, and that's caused a lot of problems. I've been on a dose of um, prednisone for about three years. Oh, yeah. I've been to lymphedema uh, therapists while I'm wrapped. I've been to Active Life. I have prescription compression socks and wraps. While I'm wrapped in sock, it's great. When I take them off, 12 hours later, I get the silly putty goiter effect around my ankle. Uh, is this something I'm just going to have to live with as long as I'm taking prednisone? Or, I mean, I'm, I've got massage, I've got some good people that I'm seeing, but when I'm not actively compressed or wrapped, or when you exercise, or when I exercise, it gets worse. when I walk more, the goiter effect tends to get worse. When you have lymphedema and swelling, you need to be in compression 24-7. So if it's just a side effect of the prednisone, then if you stop taking prednisone, 
then it should be reversible. But if it's because of um, a history of surgeries, treatments, anytime they go in, and especially abdominal surgeries, sometimes it's not even related. Um, we had one patient who never even had cancer treatment, but she had C-sections, and then she had broken her leg. I've had motorcycle accidents, and they end up with swelling. So a lot of times you have other procedures that you've had done in your life that actually can cause swelling as well. But as long as you have lymphedema, you need to be in compression 24-7. If you take it off, you are taking that pressure and the leg will swell. So there's, night, there's nighttime garments, there's daytime garments. So you can never go in a swimming pool? You can Swi actually, so pools can help with the swelling because the water pressure increases. But as soon as you get out of the pool, you have to put your garments back on. You dry off and you put them back on. But um, with swimming, uh, do you notice it getting worse? Well, it's been hard because especially the type two, they're really hard to yeah. take off and put on. I, my wife, thankfully, especially to take them off. I can put them on, but taking them off, the leverage is. It's also, he had a bone, uh, I mean, a hip, a hip, hip replacement mm -hmm. on one side. So taking that one off and on, it's not something that he can do comfortably. So you might benefit from the Velcro garments. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also donning aids, there's different things, baby powder, um, if you have open toe versus closed toe garments. There's lots of different things. So maybe you want to um, go, if Active Life did it, then um, go back and talk to them about the other options. And there are people, I mean, I always say lymphedema, there's no real cure for lymphedema, but some people can learn to play with it. So you, they know that they can go. I had, for example, I know someone who could get until like 8 or 9 p.m. before the swelling would start. So she could go through her whole day and then would put the garment on to sleep. Other people need it on all day. They can manage to get it off at night because they're somewhat elevated. And then they put it on when they wake up. So you kind of, I mean, you can go to dinner without having to wear them for a couple hours, depending on how severe it is. But really, the, you need, the more you're in compression, the better it is for you. And yeah, unfortunately. Yes. Um, so even when we were looking for the videos here, so we did um, like, I just did a search in YouTube. Yeah. So I did scar tissue massage and or balance or exercises for neuropathy. Yeah. And then we did the pelvic floor. Yeah. So if you just um, put in the topic, a lot, multiple videos will come up. We, I think, I mean, if you can find this, if you're specifically interested in these videos, you can find them on the website and then find the the link yeah. to these ones in particular. Our lecture will be posted online, so you should have access to them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. If you have lymphedema, you always have edema? Question? Yeah, so she said, if you have lymphedema, will you always have edema? So, um, your lymphedema can fluctuate depending on what you're doing. So um, if you are traveling a lot, flying, doing a lot of walking, hot weather, hot weather you can be more swollen. And then when you go to colder weather, um, it could be less swollen. Elevation, where you are in the world, if you're higher elevation or lower elevation. So usually it fluctuates. But once you have lymphedema, uh, you usually will have swelling that persists for the rest of your life. So lymphedema is a chronic condition that you have to consistently manage. Uh, sometimes I've seen people have swelling just through chemotherapy and radiation because your body's reacting to the, ke the chemicals. And then it reduces after the toxins are like flushed out through a system. But then maybe 10 years down the road, they um, cut themselves and the swelling comes back. So. Like we said, anyone who has surgery or anything is stage zero, and that's why you want to get in compression from the beginning, and you want to be educated on it so that you can monitor and manage it. Because if you start noticing it getting worse, then you might need to do more. You might need to wear your garment um, regularly or um, need some other intervention. Yeah? Does it leave a fingerprint like the um, edema? Or how do you know you've got it? Can you tell the difference between lymphedema and edema? Yes. So usually lymphedema is the one-sided. So people who have um, like peripheral artery disease, 
uh, will have both legs swelling or they'll have the ulcerations, you'll have the skin discoloration, like the purplish skin. And for the arms, usually if you have a history of breast cancer, mastectomy, and you have swelling in your arms, there's not many other things that will cause, besides like arthritis, yeah. that will cause, that's more like um, finger swelling. But if you get swelling in your arm and you have a history of breast cancer, most of the time it will be lymphedema. There's not very many other things that will cause one, one arm to swell. Does it leave it uh, fingerprint? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, all types of edema can have the pitting edema. And so, lymphedema and edema will be always leave a fingerprint. That's just a sign that you have the edema, and it's how we rank how severe it is. Okay. But even if you sprain your ankle, you can have the pitting edema just because you have swelling in that area. Mm. But the signs are that it would be one sided, it will usually start in the, the fingers. And, and hand and then work its way up versus other types of swelling that might start um, in the shoulder, work down or elbow, um, like arthritis. Yes? Is there anything, sometimes, you know, when we use the, uh, the really strong stockings that we've got, the leg will look fine, but the ankle is still swollen. Is there anything specific just for an ankle where you could wrap the ankle at night or wrap it during the day or something in addition to the uh, So usually it would be a custom stocking that they can build in padding or something firmer to go around the ankle to give that area more compression. Yes? I, I don't hear doctors prescribing these kinds of things. Um, where do we go for, uh, for this kind of a resource? So this has been our mission. So we've been actually going into a lot of the doctor's offices saying, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're recommending. And doctors are actually getting better about referring to us now. But if anything, you're usually seeing the oncologist or your primary care, the surgical oncologist, the um, plastic surgeon. So a lot of these doctors, you can just ask them for a prescription. And when they write it, you can come right over to physical therapy. So I don't know where you are. Oh, we, so we're in the veteran clinic. We have three clinics here. So we have two in Santa Monica and one here on veteran in Westwood. So it's on the intersection of veteran and Kinross. Do you have a phone number? Yes, we do. It's 310-794. One three two three. You're welcome. Yes. All these situations that you discussed tonight are they particularly reference to cancer? All these are side effects because, but you can have these conditions even if it isn't related to cancer. So childbirth is the one of the most common causes of urinary incontinence, yeah. C-sections. Um, Arthritis for stiffness, the stretching would help, the stretching and strengthening helps. Yeah, I mean. the neuropathy, like the diabetes, mm -hmm. is one of the most common um, things that we see. So it's not strictly just related to cancer, but these are the main things that we see that patients come in with complaints of that need to be addressed. Piriformis syndrome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so pure, the piriformis is the muscle in the butt that um, most doctors will say is leading to like sciatica. So your sciatic nerve either goes through or under this, the piriformis muscle. So if that muscle is either stretched out, it will pinch the nerve and cause pain. Or if the muscle is too tight and short, it's squeezing on the nerve and will cause pain. So people with piriformis syndrome, uh, you can have many different reasons of getting it, but it will refer, like, you'll either have butt pain or pain going down the back of the leg. Well, she sits many hours, she used to sit many hours at a computer, and now she makes it a point not to sit for more than an hour. Is okay. there anything else that she can or should be doing? It depends on what's causing the, the 
piriformis to get irritated. So if it's being stretched out, is it because the muscles around it are weak? Is the glute the gluteus maximus or medius weak? Is it a postural thing? Is it the way she's sitting? Is she sitting slouched with the pressure right on it? Um, so it really kind of depends. It's situational. Thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had that, and I was referred to a doctor at St. John's, and there's a doctor here that's Dr. Johnson. And I had both hips reconstructed, so other, I have normal hip sockets now, the periacetabular osteotomy. But I, I was having pain sitting, and it was the piriformis, and um, I didn't, the physical therapist didn't know until I went to the, had the x-ray of the hip. So it's always good if something doesn't go away, it's always good to have an x-ray just to yeah. So she said that she was have she was diagnosed with piriformis syndrome, and then she ended up um, finding out that she had hip dysplasia because the hip joints were abnormal. So she ended up having to get hip replacements because the pain wasn't. I had periacetabular osteotomy. I had my hip sockets cut out, rotated, and screwed back in, and then it healed with a normal hip socket. Okay. So they <laughs> they fixed her joint. <laughs> But, um, but piriformis syndrome, a lot of doctors will just write on a, a pad sciatica or piriformis syndrome. But a lot of times we find out when we are looking at patients, it's, being, it's actually something else. So it could be because something's low coming back. from the low back. It could be something from the hip joint. So it really kind of depends. So you can't really just say, oh, I have this, until you really go in and, and get it fully assessed. Any other questions? Yes. I found this very helpful. Thank you. That was our goal. So thank you. Thank you. We tried to cover a lot of areas and and subjects in a brief amount of time, because we want to give you the tools to be able to know where to go to, what to do in the meantime. Because a lot of times it takes time to get into the doctor, it takes time to get the prescription and the authorization to go through, and it takes time then to come in and see us. So at least if you know some of the things you can do while waiting, it will help. Thank you. You're welcome.